All right, welcome back to the podcast, guys. This is episode, I'm, I lost track, episode five or six, maybe? Um, of, there you go. Episode six of Wheels in Business, where we basically discuss our passion for cars and uh, passion for business and being an entrepreneur and things like that. Um, yeah, this is going to be a kind of a winged episode. We're kind of just going to go at it. Uh, every episode thus far, we've kind of had a little bit of an agenda on what we're going to talk about. But on this one, we're kind of kind of just wing it. Yeah, I think let's let's, <laughs> let's talk about this new business. I think we briefly hinted at it in some of the other ones, um, but we got love bites, uh, and I don't know how much we want to say or how much we don't. We kind of do, kind of I mean, whatever, I guess. Um, <laughs> so first of all, this is our our first time. Uh, I guess heavily going into business together, and it's funny because it's for both the podcast and uh, this new business, Love Bites. Um, so it's 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 interesting, kind of getting out of our comfort zone and doing things that uh, we're not really used to. Um, this is something we've both never done. This is a new industry. I think both the podcast and Love Bites is an, is new industries for us. Um, yeah, I mean, here's the thing, right? And here's I, I'll get I'll get started on how this shit came up. Right. So I listen to a ton of podcasts. Oh, yeah, this is funny. This is all I do, right? All I do is while I work, you know, I have a, I have a big screen um, on my desk. And so like, you know, three fourths of the screen is my work, whatever, whenever I only need one window. And then I have another window that I have for a podcast. And I caught this, this video, this podcast of, of some guy who made a chocolate and, you know, made a million dollars in revenue in the first year. Damn, I was like, that's crazy. Watched the podcast, cool, educational. Like, I took a you know solid, solid uh, amount of like um, just info from it, and I showed it to you, right? I showed it to you, then I said, dude, check this out. It's fucking crazy, and and I jokingly said, I was like, I could do this better, right? I come from a marketing background, right? I've got somewhat of an ego when it comes to, to marketing. I'm like. If non-marketing people can start a business and run it, I feel confident that I can build the same business. Like building the business is the easy part. I don't think people understand, right? Building a business is the easy part, right? Like if you're trying to make a food product or anything, like that's just a few Google searches away and you get it done, right? It's the sales and marketing to it that makes the difference, right? I'm a big believer that, uh, you know, sales comes first. Marketing is a close, you know, 1B when it comes to the importance of, of making a business successful. Is that if you can knock one of those out, you can, you can make money. Um, as so I saw it, and I was like, I could do that better, right? And I said to you, did you watch the whole thing? Yeah, of course, yeah. I watched the whole thing, but like halfway through, I was like, dude, this dude just gave out his whole business strategy. And I was like, we can duplicate this. And then I kind of started going through the uh, through the analytics of like their search, their volume, um, the uh, the terms if they were being uh, advertised on Google. <laughs> and yeah. I was like, dude, without, without saying we can, the company name, right? So like, yeah, without saying the company name, right? so like it's it's basically sex chocolate, right? It's chocolate that like I don't know how they label it, but it, it enhances, right? Or it's like it's an organic um, supplement. That just helps, like, uh, what is it, like the, the blood flow and, and whatnot um, from yeah. both sides, right? Uh, the so proper like, term I, is after the yeah. yeah, well, that's the that's the ingredient, right? Um, and so, like, that's an organic supplement, uh, an organic version of, let's just call it, like, something like, I don't even want to say bad because I don't think, that, I don't think that's the case, right? But it's in, it's in that space, right? And so I was like, I, like I could do that better. Right. And I don't see you. And I kind of threw it out the door. Right. I was like, I was like, whatever. Cause I have these ideas all the time. I'm like, I can do that better. Uh, whatever. And I think you, you like, you hit me at it at like twice, like think back to back in two days. You're like, Luis. Yeah. Dude, Cause I, I do it. Thought, like, dude, like we can replicate this and do it. Bigger. And like the cool thing yeah. about seeing a new, a new ish business that launched and became very, very successful is that I think you can identify their, uh, their flaws very quickly and you can correct them. So in theory, as long as you, you kind of just fought, like kind of piggyback off of them and then just correct their mistakes, 
in theory, you should be able to, you know, catch up to them. I mean, to be fair, to be transparent, I don't think it's that simple, right? Because what we think may be flaws is something they may have already figured out and they're already well aware of and, you know, they're not changing for whatever reason, right? So I don't think we know that for sure, but I do think there are things, right, that we can point out that we think can just make more sense in a different way, right? And we'll figure it out. We'll see if, if you know, if that's true or not. But um, you were like, let's do it. And I was like, I don't know. I was like, I, I was like, I don't know. Like, I, I come from the service side of business, right? So like, I come from a business, a, a line of business where it's service based, which means that the margins are high, right? The cost of entry is low. Like, to give to offer digital marketing services, I don't need to buy product. I don't need to be worried about logistics. I, I don't need to worry about much other than I need a contract for it before I even start working, right? And even if I'm not somewhere, right? I started the business because I, I know the marketing skills. But if you were someone who wants to start a marketing agency and you didn't know anything about marketing, but you could sell it, you can sell it, get paid, and you find someone to outsource the actual work to, right? And so there's very little like entry uh, barrier, you know, to get kind of get into that. In the food space or really almost anything else, right? Direct to consumer products, that's not the case. You need to right, build the product and build the website, build the branding and, and do everything in marketing to kind of get this out into the market. Um, and I think you hit me, you hit me like two, three times. And I don't know what it was. I was just like, I was like, all right, fuck it, let's do it. Right. And, and, and it started and it was like, all right, we're going to be like, this is what we need. Uh, and I mean, we're, we're in the motion now, right? We've got branding going, we've got design stuff going, we've got first samples of the chocolates. Uh, we should be getting samples of the packaging, hopefully shipped out tomorrow. Um, so it's crazy. It's crazy to kind of see all this roll out. And this is really, man, this is where we're going to see like, right. Cause here's the thing, right. You call it out. The guy like laid out his entire marketing plan. I am a complete advocate of that. I think mo more people should, especially from like, if you're trying to market yourself, you should tell the world, here's how I do things, right? Because the reality is, is that it's one thing to know how to take the steps or it's one thing to know what the steps are. It's another thing to know how to take those steps, right? And most people just don't take them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the vast majority don't take them, but the people who attempt it, there's more hurdles down the road, basically, that, that you kind of have to come over. Yeah, yeah. Here's one um, thing, I'll say this. Uh, one thing that was super interesting to me was, uh, I was like, even if we start this and fail, I think the learning curve of just seeing our mistakes and seeing exactly where we went wrong and like just all that, I think is as valuable on its own. I don't think we're gonna fail. I, I'm, I, I'm pretty big on like, this is gonna go far, but Worst case scenario, you still learn a lesson and you kind of still learn, uh, you learn tips and tricks for the next business. Now, nah, fuck that. <laughs> Losing two grand, uh, we're going to be in, we're going to be in like 20 grand, right? Give or take. I think by the time we get this out to the market and cleaned up and polished to an extent, because we're not trying to polish things up right 100%. Um, we're trying to get it out to the market yeah. and just get, make sure that everything is at least up to standard from a quality perspective. Again, I come from a marketing background and branding and stuff like that. Like I, I want it to be up to a certain standard. Um, and we're going to be like 20 grand in, right. Once we do this and that probably doesn't include the marketing cost. So we probably got to spend another initial quick five grand on marketing and probably an additional five grand on other stuff. Um, you know, so we're talking about like. 30 grand in so i'm I, i've been in the marketing space long enough to understand that you can have the world's shittiest product or service but if you market it well you can make money um and so yeah. worst case scenario Mark for my head is we sell the shit out of it we sell everything we buy and then we call it quits if we want to um i don't think we're out you know, the money, or at least that's not in my head. Cause like, and again, I, I just, the idea of failing didn't even like, doesn't cross my head. I'm like, Nope. I was like, the only thing that's going to fail is possibly the marketing is we may have to rebrand it or just re pivot the messaging or something like that. But there's already proof of concept that the, it, the market exists for this. Right. And in my oh, yeah, opinion, the, marketing, I'm a hundred percent. 
in my years of marketing, the I think only that, thing that sells is sex. <laughs> Have you seen a uh, YG recently did an interview, and he literally says that uh, he's like uh, a bunch of the homies. He's like, you know, they go to these fucking gas stations and they take these rhino pills. He's like, you know, and I care about the homies. I don't want them to die young because they're over here downing these uh, these unhealthy chemicals. He's like, but if I can tell you one thing, it's that sex sells. So I'm going to create a healthy version, basically a healthy Viagra, uh, which I think is just kind of trying to copy like Blue Chew and like doing all those things. Um, but, dude, I mean, if it sells, it sells, dude. I, I'm, I'm a big advocate. I don't care what I'm selling, dude, as long as obviously it's legal and everything's good. Uh, dude, I'll sell anything. I don't care. And, and, and you, you know me, too. dude. I come from a background. Dude, I was in the corner. Yeah. I mean, and to, to be fair, right, I think the, the slight corrections, we took that really as kind of the starting pillar. And then we kind of, you know, we made a pretty big shift on what the business is actually going to be, right? Like the selling point is really no longer like the chocolate itself. And so I think that really transitions more into like an actual segment in the market, right? That is like people who are in a relationship for, you know, you can label whatever the number is, but a, two years, three years, four years in, or whatever, again, whatever you want to put the number at, at some point, right? Uh, there are stats out there that you know, couples either stop having sex or it's just like routine sex, right? And so yeah. the goal here really is to, and, and to add on even more to that, that ends up causing problems in the relationship, right? And, and, and that's fair. No doctor or anything, but again, right, reading headlines, stuff like that. I think we'll get more into like stats and stuff like that. I think that's where we're going. But, you know, having issues in the bedroom causes issues in the relationship. I think that's a known statement at this point. And so that's really, I think the part we're trying, we're, we're going to tackle um, that I think actually has like an impact and I can actually stand behind business first. Right. So like, there's definitely that. Um, but I want to make sure we identify a pain point and we're trying to address the pain point. We're not just pushing stuff out for the sake of pushing stuff out. Um, so I think there is that. Yeah, I think, uh, I think most people in relationships can, uh, can agree that the big differentiating factor between having like a quote unquote best friend and a roommate, uh, in comparison to like, a, you know, a couple or a relationship is literally just that time in a bedroom and like that physical touch. Uh, and if you don't have that, you literally become like roommates or best friends. Um, yeah. Which, you know, it kind of ruins things, uh, I think, in the long run. So that that's kind of a, I think, I mean, just tackling marketing in that aspect, right? Kind of just that that's the selling point of like, you know, spark up your relationship and uh, don't lose the spark, I, I would say, you know, uh, keep things spicy, uh, continue on uh, with your, you know, intimacy. Don't, don't lose that aspect of things because basically when that ends, the relationship kind of ends unless they have kids or something, but that's a whole other dilemma on its own. Yeah. And even then, right. It, it can be like a thing for parents to like That can be another reason why like this, there's people who have, you know, great sex for a long time, but then they have kids and then that goes down. Right. Because you go from being a couple to being parents. Um, right. Again, I think there's a ton of different reasons why that should happen, but it happens is right. Is, is I think the main thing here. And so it's really not that crazy to try and fix that problem. Right. I think it, it, it's, it's, I mean, that's kind of what we're trying to do here. Right. It's like, Hey, how do you get like the mental juices going again so that it's not just like routine stuff anymore. Um, and you, you spice it up a bit more, but like a chore. Yeah. Right. And so I'm super excited to kind of get it out there. I think right now, right. It's just, it's, I don't want to say it's frustration, but I think it's, it's, it's the, it's having the patience to let other people do what they need to do from like, so like right now our dilemma, right, is that branding can't finish until we get the packaging done, right? Uh, packaging is just going to be delayed. We have the actual chocolate being made, um, even chocolate, like, um, what, what are you taking care of? Pretty much done, I, I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the last part from him, because he's also taking care of the wrappers, is just going over, seeing if we can print 
right? The the branded uh, the branded stuff we have on the wrapper. So I mean, everything's still kind of on hold, right? And the bigger the bigger kind of part of this whole thing is getting the website done and the ecom checkout and all you know the back and stuff like that. Now that stuff is kind of put on hold because we're need we're waiting for like the packaging. The tricky part, right? And this isn't anything, is that you get a designer and you tell them to be creative. He gives you something creative and you try and actually make that creative stuff actually come into the real world and they don't always line up, right? And so I think that's kind of where we're at is like we had a, a package design here and then we're talking to the packaging company. Hey, can you can you make this, right? And we'll get, you know, prototypes hopefully in the next few days. Um, that's kind of where we're at right now. We're, we're aiming for a launch. And like December, I mean, it's October. Yeah, we're, we're aiming for a launch in December. So it would be great to get it out for the holidays. I think that would be sick. Um, and then yeah. January start advertising for Valentine's Day. Um, and I think that'll be like our seasonal stuff. And then I think we'll get more into like the evergreen, like the general messaging, um, you know, come post Valentine's Day and stuff like that. And even then, like summer is wedding time. So like, you know, there's that, but yeah, super, I'm, I'm super stoked for it. Uh, like it's not year round, like no problem. Yeah, I mean, that's, again, that's marketing, right? You, you make the goddamn product fit for whatever time of the year it is. Um, so Love Bites, it's, it's funny, right? Because I've, I've chatted with a few friends uh, and my girlfriend, it's like, we talk about it and it's like, it's funny when you think about it. Uh, I don't know. It's like, I guess just saying it out loud is funny. Um, the bag I got, I don't know about yours, but you haven't, got, you haven't opened yours yet, but the bag of chocolates, right, said uh, sexual chocolate coming to America. <laughs> um, and when I, posted on Insta- when I posted it on Instagram, I don't know if you even noticed, I put a little heart emoji or like that one plus you know, emoji thing over the sexual word. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's going to be cool. We'll see how it goes. It's going to be a crazy experience, man. Uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes. And uh, I'm excited. I'm excited for this. Uh, I feel like might as well. I, there's one thing you told me last time that kind of hit me and you, you were just kind of like, if you're making the money, might as well throw it, try to, uh, try to make something stick and, uh, you know, multiply the money as much as you can um and now i'm kind of getting into that mindset where i'm like ah, that's true like i'm making the money i might as well invest it into something that could potentially be something significantly bigger uh and i'm excited to see where this goes i mean it's like right alex ramosi talks about this a lot right and kind of coined this term the a lot of people like to right they give a suggestion when you're young you're supposed to invest in the s p 500 but he says you should invest in the s p my uh 500 or me 500 or some shit like that Basically, like, yeah. yeah, like you should invest in yourself before you invest in the market. Like if you're not making over, you know, half a million dollars, like you can get there by investing in yourself and your own skill set or a business versus investing in the stock market, you know, that may get you some sort of return in the next five years or so. It's like you're right. Your skills will multiply yeah. you a lot quicker than the stock market will. And so, I mean, right. I, I've already got a decent amount of money in the market now, and I don't necessarily want to feed it more. I, I'd rather just like, hey, where can I throw this money somewhere else, right? I spend a lot of the money back into my business already as it is. Um, and I figured I was like, well, got more money. Let's, let's, let's try something different. Um, so here we are. That's one thing. Now, here's the crazy part about me, right? I feel like thus far in my life, I haven't really thrown money at things trying to make it stick, right? I've been in sales my whole life, so it's always been more, each sale gets me more money, right? It's, it's always been that exchange. Or I guess like the more formal exchange would be, I'm always exchanging my time for money, uh, not on mm-hmm. an hourly basis, but I'm still putting in the work to get a paycheck. Uh, and this is the first time in my life where I'm kind of throwing money, trying to have the money basically work for me instead. Yeah, and even for me, it's different because I, I again i come from more of a service-based industry so like, it's like I, i'm also like exchanging you know uh time for money um you know whether it's me doing it or someone else like you know it, it takes me moving things 
uh, in order for that money, you know, to kind of keep coming. And so this would be the first time where it's like, if you can get something working, and again, and this is the trick bar, right? And it's funny, this is like a joke for any marketer out there, I'm sure, right? It's like, if you're a marketer at any level, especially if you're at an agency where you have a list of clients, I remember when, when I worked at the agency, we had certain clients that we talk about, it's like, Damn, can you believe they're making this much money? And it's like, we're making it for them, right? Because we're the marketers running it for them. But it's like, we can build this business, right? And it doesn't take much for a marketer at an agency who has a list of accounts, I, you know, they have access to and say, damn, you know, that business is making a lot of money and it doesn't take much for me to be able to build something like that. I can do it, right? But it's like, people were afraid of taking the jump in the commitment and not just a commitment from time perspective, but commitment from a money perspective, right? Like how much is it going to cost you to kind of run all that? Um, yeah, because in theory, right, even like the 30 grand we're going to be in, like, let's just split it in two. Most people, one, don't have 15 grand like that to just throw at something. And the people that do, uh, I feel like they got there being very frugal and saving and kind of like uh, pickpocketing yeah. every, every diamond and stuff like that. And to, to gamble that, I mean, it's, I wouldn't say it's like throwing it on black on roulette, but I, I feel like it's damn near, damn near close. That's what it feels like, even if it can probably land a lot better than they, uh, than they expected to, uh, expected to land, you know? Yeah. No. And, and again, right. Because in my, in my head, right. I think if you can be really good at either marketing or sales, you can make any business succeed. Right. And I'm assuming most people probably are not experts in either of those fields. Right. And so you add that layer in, it gets even scarier to start a business. Right. It's like, I have this idea. I mean, and you see it all the time, especially in the food industry. Right. You have a lot of people who are really good with food and they, you know, they can make some delicious stuff and they get super excited and they're like, let me open a restaurant or a cafe or something. Right. And they open it and it just doesn't work out because, you know, passion doesn't make a business successful. Right. Business makes a business successful. If you ask me. Um, and in my head, it's just like, I'm like, I've got the marketing down. I've, I've got decent sales, right? And I think I understand it well enough, uh, because I got to sell in my business anyways, but I'm definitely not like a top tier, you know, sales person, but I'm learning. Um, and I'm like, I, I can sell this. Like, I know the market well, I know the market of like user behavior and direct to consumer type products. I was like, we can sell this. So let's see how it goes. You know, it's one thing that you told me that really, really stood out. It was uh, most people are good at their craft, but most people don't know how to run a business. It's like you can have, let's use your example, for example, you know, you can have the best food in the world. It could be the best thing, right? Something that you know <coughs> everyone will love, but if you don't have the business expertise behind it, it's a uh, damn kind of useless at that point, you know, like it's basically a, a, a death sentence for your business. Uh, so you, you yeah. definitely need to know both. I don't think you need to be perfect at both. I think trial and erroring uh, for long enough will eventually give you the skill set. Uh, but I think the majority, the vast majority of people don't even get there. Yeah. I mean, and here's the shitty part though, right? It's like, if you have those two skill sets, right? let's say let's say you have the you know the skill set of whatever you're selling, so let's just call it food in this case, and then you have the business skill set, right? Which business means like marketing and sales. If you have this one and suck at this one, it can work, right? Whereas if you flip that around, not saying that it can't work, but I personally trust you know the other side better. And I'll give you an example. I've been to a lot of very fancy restaurants that have a ton of reviews and very expensive, uh, very nice to be at, and the food fucking sucked, right? Or at <laughs> best, it was average, right? Nothing special. and But they're booked because they had great uh, images and videos of, of the restaurant. The restaurant's like on a hillside, basically, you know, overlooking, I think, like Pasadena or something like that. Um, and the aesthetics of the entire restaurant, super cool, everything like, you know, from a visual perspective. But I went with right, me, my daughter and my girlfriend and all of our plates, dude, was a pile of shit. Like it was terrible. Um, 
And that's just an example of. of you think this kind of. Uh, you're, they're selling the experience. Yeah. I, and it, that's very much like a, a millennial thing now. And maybe not millennial, but I think it started with millennials, right? Millennials are very much about like the trendy spots and stuff like that. And I think it's still continued. And I think it's a lot more because of social media, not necessarily us. It's just, you know, the social media kind of enhanced that and so we kind of fell into that. But like, for example, right, I'm talking to a business right now where uh, they have a restaurant. They just acquired a restaurant and it's on the, it's on a piece of an airport. And so their outside patio sees the airplanes land and the restaurant That's manager was like yeah we have people call in and they're like hey i'm gonna land about in about 40 minutes can i make a reservation or are you guys open or are you guys busy and they're like 40 minutes and she's like i forgot people fly in and you have pilots who land airplanes park the airplane and go to the restaurant to eat i'm like that is crazy yeah and i was talking to, to this guy right who owns it and i was like dude i was like we can blow this up. I was like, this just needs some good content. He wants to, he wanted to spend money on PBC and SEO and stuff. I was like, I was like, no, I was like, I don't think that's where, you know, things are going to really, I don't think that's where you should prioritize things. I think you should prioritize them creating like content, you know, and throwing it over on socials and stuff like that. I think that would be crazy. Cause like today, and Missy and I were just talking about this. I think the problem we're seeing is that a lot of small restaurants uh, aren't capable of handling high volume, right? And so you end up in these long lines that creates a bad user experience and so on. And then people get the ambition, right? Like, okay, well, let me open a bigger place or a second location. It just doesn't always work out like that because it's not that simple, right? It's not that straightforward. And so I think the experience is, is what sells and the experience takes you so far but it doesn't like make up for the lack of business skills. You know, you still kind of need that side. And it's not that you need to be perfect, like you said, right? You just gotta, you gotta be open to learning it and like aware of kind of the, the do's and don'ts of that stuff. I think right now for the food industry, I think like restaurants and things like that. Yeah, I, I definitely agree that I think content is anyone's best friend. And I think we're, we're switching from PPC, right? Cause I feel like five years ago, and while it may still somewhat be useful, I think PPC was a lot more valuable five years ago for restaurants than it is today when it comes to like, in comparison to content. I feel like right now content and creating uh, just videos that people can see that kind of gives them an urge to want to go visit a place because they see a good experience, uh, I think mm -hmm. it's more valuable right now. I think content for any business. I talk to a lot of businesses and I was like, I don't care if you're the B2B, your tech, your AI, whatever space you're in, the content I think is what's going to, you know, kind of create like, that's going to be the main pillar of marketing over the next decade. Right. And the, the Alex Hormozis and the Gary V's of the world is, is a lot of kind of what they say every day. Right. And it's, and it's what they're doing. It's, it's easier to, you know, to, to believe what someone is doing, what someone is saying, if they're doing it themselves. Right. And I mean, there's a reason why the, you know, Alex Hormozzi and, and Gary V are as big as they are is because, we see them because they're making content, right? Of, of all the shit they do. Um, kind of going yeah. a little bit off topic. I don't know. I think I mentioned it to you before. Uh, Alex Hermosi dropped a video, basically, quote unquote, breaking down uh, his success on social media. And he's like, mm -hmm. let, me, let me tell you guys exactly how I did it. And I was like, ooh, you know, notepad. Let me take some notes. He's yeah. like, so basically what I did is like I hired an agency at 30 grand a month. I was like, let me just shut this off right now. No. <laughs> but, you know, I hired an agency uh, at 30 grand a month and I, I was very transparent with what I wanted to do. And he was basically saying, I want an in-house team that can study exactly what you guys are doing month to month. Uh, and we will leave when my team perfects what you're doing. And, uh, and I think he said, uh, I still kept him on a contract at a, at a smaller rate. Uh, for the following year, just as if we had any questions or anything, we can ask them. You know what's crazy, dude, is I swear, every, right? So he launched that, I think, right after his book launch. And, right, that, that's one of the things he preaches, right? It's like, hey, pay someone just to teach you. Um, and then you, you can take it from there. 
I've, I've had, a, I have a call tomorrow or I have a call Wednesday with someone who's looking to do exactly that. They want to work on a three month project where I am doing the work, but I'm also, uh, setting stuff up for a point that they can kind of take that, that with them so that they know how to also kind of keep building on that. Um, and I think it's going to be like a, a, a group of like four of them, right. That I'm basically like quote unquote training, um, alongside me doing the work learning from someone that that already that already established and they know what they're doing uh i feel like that that's like the shortcut right quote unquote shortcut because you know i don't think there is any shortcuts but it, it's a way of you to pay to get it expedited right to kind of expedite this expedite this skill mm -hmm. i mean yeah I, I think and i'm sure obviously i think like Hormozy would say otherwise, but like, it, it, it's just, it's not that easy, right? Like marketing specifically, at least, right? That, that's what I know. Marketing specifically, um, there's like a million different versions of the same thing that can happen, right? And so like, there's just like, there's never a template response or a template reaction to, to doing something. Um, and to be fair, there's no one right way to do things either, right? You can always do things like a ton of different ways. And I think a ton of mark, I know a ton of marketers that do shit, do the same shit a different ways. And I, I don't think one is better than the other. And I'm always a big like advocate. Like, I don't, I don't care if I, if I agree with you or not, it's like, does it make sense? If it makes sense, I'm all for testing it. Right. I think as marketer, that's the number yeah. one, you just gotta be open to test and shit. So like, I'm like, if it makes sense and you can, you know, uh, voice it in a way that, you know, there has, there's some logic to it. I'm like, I don't agree with it, but I was like, let's do it. Um, and yeah. we'll do things. Um, in the, in the time frame that I was learning marketing, I, I remember just that being like kind of the main thing, just kind of test things and see what works and what doesn't. Um, yeah, that was a handful of things that I learned. It's funny, like irrelevant to marketing handful of things I learned that I use that logic and the ideology to like kind of make decisions in real life. I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of like taking my work to my personal life, uh, <laughs> you know, with in the relationship with my daughter, like with everything, right. I am, I am very much a lot more, uh, work-minded than I am like, you know, on being like personal to someone else. And I, I think I, I've been guilty of like not knowing how to separate. It's like, for example, like in an argument, I'm like, Hey, what's your problem? What do I need to do to fix the problem? Cool. Addressed. Got it. Let's move on. And it's not that simple, right? Because someone's mad on the other side. And so, like, you got to address, you know, that side of things. Um, but, yeah. I'm, I'm but you like breaking I, things. I find things. Down. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I find things that, like, uh, that, that work for me in work and then try and translate that. And to be fair, like, for my girlfriend, I was like that almost, you know, 100%. <laughs> I, my only way of being personal was by doing things in my work way, right? And I think it took me her to realize like that's just not the way it works, right? Um, well, just some people uh, they think more emotionally than they do like this straightforward kind of logic way, uh, which they should. Does. We're human beings, like we're not robots. So yeah, very true. But I think. Uh, I think I think guys that are in business, we like to think as close to as we can to robots, as we, you know, like we, we yeah. stick as close to that wall as we can, because uh, I think a good businessman can uh, maintain their composure and be a, as least emotional as they can be in order to make like the proper decisions and things like that. Yeah. And I think that makes sense in, for business. In comparison to yeah, real like, life, you know, real life, yeah. you know, everyone has actual emotions and they're trying to, you know, show them or whatever. Yeah, yeah, crazy. Uh, to kind of uh, go a little bit off topic of this, I know I told you right before this, um, another, uh, our first and second podcast, actually our second and third, was talking about our financial responsibility when it comes to cars. <laughs> and uh, I just, I don't know why, I'm always on Facebook Marketplace kind of just searching up for random things. And are, I find uh, a 2000... That's how you get yourself in these problems. <laughs> it is what it is but i find a 2003 uh mitsubishi evo 8 
all right, which if anyone knows about cars, it's the Fast and the Furious car, right? The two Fast and Furious car, uh, the yellow one that Paul Walker drives. Uh, and let me just say, that's for sure when it comes to like the JDM legends, right? I think the Evo 8's in there on the on the lower spectrum of things. And then it's like the NSX, the Supra, and uh, the R34, and perhaps even the RX-8. Um, but an Evo 8 is on that list. An Evo 8 is like for sure, like I, I think I've always wanted one that's just super clean and simple. Because I think those cars, right, I think they stand out from the crowd for most modern cars, unless you have like a Porsche. Uh, you have to do a lot to stand out. Uh, and I think for those older cars, it, just having them in clean condition makes you stand out. <coughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not a fan. I don't know. The point is, I found this thing at a very, very good price. I offered the guy. Actually, I haven't offered, but I'm going to go see it tomorrow. And uh, I'm going to offer the guy a certain amount. If he takes it, cool. If he doesn't, it was meant to be. But I know for a fact I can make money on this car if I buy it for the right uh, for the right price. And those cars, all these JDM cars, dude, it's crazy the market of, like, JDM cars. Like, for example, a first-generation S2K with low miles. And if it's an oh, yeah. S2Ks are skyrocketing in price. Like it's yeah. ridiculous. But it's because they're so sought after. People want yeah. clean, clean title <coughs> S2Ks. Another one would be uh, the 350Z Nismo. The Nismo yeah. versions are skyrocketing in price. And shh, don't hate the game, you know, like just just play it. Uh and yeah. I, I'm a, I'm gonna be a, a happy dude if he accepts my offer tomorrow, and it's gonna be an interesting little. Uh... Ultimately, though, I will say a thousand percent, the goal would be to just drive it for like maybe five six months, little weekend car, uh, and then I, then I just sell it. You know, I I don't think I'd keep the car because I think I already have too many as it is. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, quick little update. How's your bug? Uh, my first gear went out. Did I tell you? So I, I went no. out driving. Right. So I do, well here's the thing, right? I bought this bug like two years ago. Right? I bought, bought it, it at the like, same Damn. time I bought that. <laughs> yeah. I bought it and I was like I was like sweet. I was like three, four months and I'm gonna have an increasing condition. Right. And me being bad with like tasks and stuff, dude. I had four grand like set aside, right, in cash just to like you know, for just, just for the bug, right? I was like, cool, this is money here, I'm good. That way you just, you know, I, that way I didn't overspend, whatever, whatever. And I needed a mechanic to swap out a, the carburetor, like just a piece of the engine. Other than that, it, it didn't start because of that, right? And I was like, yeah, I'll find them, I'll find them. A month goes by, yeah, I'll find them, I'll find them. And see my brother like that, like, you know, I was like, I'll find it, I'll find it. A year later, nothing. Two years later. <laughs> and Missy's like, Luis, yeah, I'm going to find yeah, the shop for you. Huh? Hey, uh, I think you bought it right before COVID, didn't you? No. You bought it after COVID? Yeah, it was after COVID. <laughs> yeah. Okay, gotcha. Um, but I bought it and then Missy was finally like, Luis, I'm going to find a shop for you. And if I, if, I, if I find a shop for you, will you take the bug in? I was like, yes, please. And sure enough, she finds a shop here in Costa Mesa, right? She calls, makes the appointment. I towed the motherfucker over there. And <laughs> two weeks later, right? So I, I got the, I got the brakes upgraded from drums to discs because fucking driving on drum brakes is the scariest thing in the world. Um, I got a short shifter installed. And I got, I think, my links, some of the links um, on the axles uh, uh, replaced out because they were garbage. Oh, and then the carburetor uh, got upgraded. Um, took it home. Got stranded on the way home because the guy was like, hey, you should probably go for some gas. It's got really old gas. And I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. Stop at the gas station. Uh, I don't know where the gas, I don't know where the, the place to pump the gas is at. I, I remember being in a bug as a kid, but I don't remember. Like, I couldn't remember. And I was, like, looking around. I was, like, no, nothing. 
And the funny part is like, I tried to open the front trunk, but it was stuck. And I was like, it's not gonna be in there, whatever. And I was like, ah, whatever, I'll make it home. Cause I look at the gas meter, the gas meter says it's like half tank. I'm like, I'll make it home. Start driving home, I'm, I'm cruising, right? It's cool. Uh, I got the, the rag tops so open, windows are down. I'm, I mean, everyone's staring. I'm driving, going on the highway, going like 50. And then I don't, it's just, and the car, I, I <laughs> immediately could tell, like, fuck, the car, the car ran out of gas. I was like, damn. And pulled <laughs> over. Missy helps me out. She brings me a tank of gas. Pumped it. I pumped that. Oh, I called the shop. Yo, I'm going to ask you the most embarrassing question I ever did. Where the fuck do I pump gas? <laughs> Guy starts laughing. She's like, oh, your front, it's in your front trunk. I was like, oh. He's like, all right. Second dumbest question. How do I open it? Right, he's like, "Oh, there's a lever inside the car. You pull it." I tried pulling it before, but it wouldn't open. But it's because the thing was just jammed. So I kept like yanking it. Finally, open. Got home. I had the car here in the house like three weeks. We were riding it almost every single day, for, like Starbucks or something. Keep in mind, the car has no seatbelts, has no license plate, barely has lights, no signal. It's a death trap by all means. Like it's literally got a hole on the floor on the inside. I think because of like battery acid. And but we're cruising, it's cool. I'm only going like 30 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour, not even right, it's low. And it's a short shifter, so dude, when I tell you it's short, like from gear to gear, it's like two centimeters over, right? And like you're like you know going to the next gear. So I don't know if I damaged it or I felt it off right away, to be honest. But I was just like, whatever, I can get it in gear, so I kept going. And then last week, last week, me and uh, Maribel and I are going to go get food. I'm like, see the bug. Go, we're at the light. Ah. Like, first gear just doesn't go in. I'm like, fuck. And I'm only a block away, right? And the car's super light. I was like, whatever, I just punched this shit. And I was like, really? Is this thing not going in? And I was like, I wonder, is that the only gear that's not working? And I put it in second, second gear goes in. And I tried giving it gas, and it, go and it goes. And I was like, oh, fuck, all right. So I don't know what happened, but I'm gonna go buy another another shifter, a regular one. I'm not. I hate this short shifter shit. And buy a regular one, get that swapped out. Then I gotta, I got, I gotta get it sent to uh, the electric guy to just clean up all the wires because the wires are a mess. Then from there, I got an appointment for the paint shop um, to get it all painted, and then I'll start buying like all all the pieces. So, long story short, it was fun while it lasted. Shit broke down, yeah. and now I have the excuse. I did. I wasn't sending it off to the electric guy because I wanted to drive it. I, I just had so much fun driving it. But now that it's kind of broken, I'm like, yeah, whatever. And so, um, I'm gonna ship it off. It's, I don't think it's in San. It's in San Pedro. I don't want to drive the car all the way over there. So I'm just gonna tow it, and then the body shop is in Long Beach. Um, so what's the goal? What, what, uh, have you chosen a color? What, what color do you want to do? Yeah, I want to do like a like a, a GT silver or like a darker silver, um, and then the the chrome accents, and then on the inside maybe like a burgundy red. Honestly, might be cool. I still want to keep it like oh, as classic as possible, um, you know. So like some sort of classic traditional color scheme, but. Yeah, I want to fix it up, have it for like, you know, the summer maybe or like early spring just, and then probably get rid of it. How much do those things go for in one specific stop? A lot of money. So I bought the car for six and a half grand. I'll probably throw in like, you know, six, seven grand into it. So I'm in what, like 12, 13? Probably sell it for like 20, if not Damn. more. Yeah. So like it's crazy it's crazy all our life every time you put money into cars you never get that money back but with classics you yeah, do seriously. and more and yeah i mean the, here's the thing though right it's like with uh with jdm cars your 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 target demographic and people you're selling to are other kids you know um they don't have and money classics you're selling demographic yeah with with classics you're selling you know to like an older guy um yeah let's see so i'm i'm, I'm just looking at it right now 
a car, uh, 1963, which is what I got, 15 and a half thousand, and it's like decently conditioned, and it's not a rag top, like it's just a hard top. If I look for a rag top right here, 25,000. Damn. That's crazy. And it's not even like. Okay, good investment, right? I'm going to have it nicer condition than what this guy has. But yeah. It's going to be crazy. I think you drive it, dude. I'm like uh, excited to drive this thing. Yeah, it's cool. But it's I feel like it's always breaking. Down. Yeah, I think that's what it is. It's an experience. It's kind of yeah. just that that low and uh, low, slow, and just kind of cool classic uh kind of vibe it reminds me just kind of like driving on the beach yeah i mean that's really what i wanted for like i just want to bump music drive by the beach and have it be a good time but yeah i'm stoked for that although i will okay, say well, like, i'm up? still on the dying verge of getting this porsche i was literally about to ask that did you uh Find any other ones? Um, no, so I, Dude, I I've, I've searches, literally been looking at that. Yeah, I do my searches like monthly, give or take, um, to see when things are for sale. And and it's just like it. <laughs> man dude it's just it's so much money for a car like does that make sense oh uh, what's that guy that you're always sending me dude uh the the, the 22 year old that owns that agency oh um easy e-a-z-y or at least that's that's, that's his instagram handle I, I don't know um yeah, there you go. I watched a video of his recently where uh, he's speaking about uh, the the dumb things he spends money on, but the dumb things that aren't necessarily that dumb. And two of the things he talks about are are cars that hold their value, like Porsches or watches. I know watches is a big one, dude. He has like a almost three million dollar collection of watches. Oh um, um, no, no, that's a uh, Iman. Yeah, no, that guy. There you go. Yeah. I mean, and here's the thing too, right? I, I just saw this thing today where someone posted on YouTube, they were saying how, um, you know, with the transition of all these hybrid stuff, like Porsche is going to try and push out these natural, uh, uh, natural, uh, how do you say it? Natural aspirated uh, engines as far as they can, but like they're bound to, to stop, you know? And then not just that, but like GT4s aren't a, a, like, um, they don't make them every year and so like and they're not massively produced like this car can easily you know kind of be on the if you keep the car for like three years which i think is as far the second porsche announces hey we are no longer making na engines prices are going to skyrocket for anything below that um for any of the gt cars <laughs> Dude, honestly, I don't think it's a bad investment. However, I will say getting the the one that's uh, 160, that one is you have to be you have to be uh prepared to keep it for a long time in order for not you not to lose any money. I think I would. That's a problem. I don't know. In in my I'm head, sure have a nice I'm like, fuck. I'm like, am I gonna? You know, it's funny too, right? So like, remember you asked me, you're like, dude, talk to your tax people and see how these other like people uh, write off their cars. And I have, a, I have an appointment with them on Saturday to kind of finalize my, my business taxes and whatnot and bookkeeping. Um, and I asked them, I was like, here's a brand, I was like, random question. I was like, is it an actual thing to like buy a sports car through the business and expense it? Uh, if it's used in content related to the business. Um, and he said, uh, yeah, there's definitely a way to do it. We'll talk about it on Saturday. Um, there you go. <laughs> yeah. I, I think uh, here, here's one thing, right? And I think you said this to me. You don't know what you don't know. 
right? And I think for the, yeah. the majority of people, they, they try to <clears throat> they try to use logic and they try to convince themselves that it's not what it is. But it's like, dude, like I'm, and I've been preaching this to you for probably the last few years. Uh, but I think there's so much about taxes that we don't know that I swear 10 years from now, we're going to be like, how are we the, this dumb? You know, I feel like that's, that's like the one investment we could have done. Uh, Dude, I hate taxes with the past. Yeah. And, and because... the reason I hate taxes so bad is because I'm just so like, I'm so ignorant to it. Like, and I'm not ignorant in the sense that like, I refuse to learn, but it's just so fucking complicated. Like, it is not an easy thing to grasp because there's just so much, right? And it's like textbook stuff. It's like section 719A-B says you can do this, but you know, and so like, there's like, you get into the rabbit hole shit. Um, and so I think it is, I mean, there's, there's value. For me, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, seeing these, uh, right. There's like, obviously there's tax brackets, but seeing the highest bracket, right. Seeing the billionaires, the Donald Trump's of the world say that they're using these big loopholes to not yeah. pay taxes. And you're like, in theory, right. Someone making hundred million a year, 10 million a year that, that doesn't know how to do their taxes efficiently in comparison to someone making a billion dollars a year that knows all these loopholes is probably paying less taxes than the guy under. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's mind boggling. It's like, dude, like there's just, there's so much there that I feel like there's a uh, taxes are like the C for me, you know, like there's just never enough to know. I yeah. think uh, eventually you just start doing so much. And if it's in, if it's legal, it's legal. Like, you know, there, there's, saw, there's no this, way around it. Yeah, I searched it on YouTube, right? Just to kind of see what someone else would say. And I found this guy, right, who says, like, here's how I write off all my exotic cars. Right? And he's like, he's like, and I will give comments. He's like, I've been that's audited. Huh? I said, that's my type of video. <laughs> yeah. And he starts off by saying, he's like, hey, I've been audited by the IRS and I haven't had a problem. Um, but he says, he's like, you know, you got to make sure that, you know, it, it truly is uh, a business asset. He's like, I, he's like, before my YouTube channel was about cars, it was only slightly about cars, but I used all, I, I, I always used the car in the business. I don't have like this huge logo on the car. Uh, he's like, I have my license plate. That is, that is the business name. But other than that, like, I don't have any crazy logos. Like you see some of these cars out here. That, but I go see clients in it. You know, I show it in content all the time. I create short form content in it and all the time. And, it, and it's, it's a marketing asset for me. Like I work with clients and he's like, uh, this is my way to get certain clients. And I firmly believe that I, if I didn't have the car showing, I wouldn't be getting some of these clients. Um, and when you put it like that, like that makes sense, right? Especially now that we're doing like this stuff, like this is very much for as much as it's a podcast between me and you. If, if this blows up, right, the goal here, right, is that we're connecting with people who have a business big enough that they're affording the cars we're talking about. And if that is the case, that's a business connection, right? And now it's, exactly. hey, yes, I've got this marketing agency. Do you need help? Yes, I do, right? And so this connects to that that way, right? Having other short form content where uh, you know, I'm driving the car, I'm in the car and stuff like that. Like that from a, th just think about it from a simple thumbnail perspective, right? Having the car versus no car more often than not, the car will get them more clicks. Um, and so like, it, it makes sense. Like if you were to hear that and like, that's the justification you give the IRS, I'm like, I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. But I, I think you're right. It's, it's like the fear of just like, uh, Cause it's not the world I come from. That's, that's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to follow shit by the book and I assume everything I don't know is shady, which is definitely not the case. Like, I think I understand that, but sometimes it's like, it sounds too good to be true. Right. But the thing is like now, right on the flip side is like, if it's a $140,000 car and I save 30% on taxes simply because it's a business expense. That's a lot of fucking money. Right. And that's a big <laughs> Owning, that's a big difference in owning that car, right? Is if, am I paying, you know, $2,500 a month pre-tax or after tax? 
because yeah, of different numbers. Um, you know, um, uh, I I got into uh, I know I told you I got into like card counting right with uh, with blackjack. And mm-hmm. the whole like concept of card farming is is so fascinating because there's what you just said right now triggered like this idea, right? I'm doing everything by the book, right? And in theory, right, this book is the way you're supposed to do things. But like in blackjack card counting, it's like there's the book, there's card counting, and then there's a whole separate book. It's like you're supposed to do all these things because you know this, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's two separate books. I genuinely think taxes are the same way. To where it's like the average person is going to abide. The vast majority of the population is going to abide by the first book. It's the book that applies mm-hmm. to almost everybody, right? It's the general things. It's the things that it's like you can kind of figure it out on your own. I think it's the complicated stuff uh, that are that like the, they're the true loopholes, you know, the uh, the ways you can get ahead uh, tax wise, uh, but still be within reason of it being completely legal and all that. You know, ultimately, the last thing you want to do is run a million dollar business on on like something shady. Uh, but if it's not shady, it's fair game. You know, if, 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 if the IRS is out that guy and he's still good, it means he's doing something right. Yeah. To be fair to like, uh, I, I talked to Missy about this. Um, it would be fun to like, I, I, I've never worked with anything car related, like from a business, like from my marketing perspective, it would be so cool to like step into that field. Um, and I've been meaning to like do like an outbound, uh, marketing effort to like reach out to like all the exotic dealerships and just see, Hey, where can I help from a marketing perspective at like no cost, just to simply, cause right in, at least in my space. And I think this goes for any sort of space case studies rule, everything. Do you have case studies for something that is someone else saying, Hey, that guy can do the job. Right. Um, and I just, I, I want to work with, with a dealership to get a case study out of them. Because then that helps me kind of step into, you know, other and show other dealerships, hey, yo, I can do what you're looking for. Here's a proven case study to show that I've already done it. Right. Um, Yeah. And I think that's one of those tangents again, where it's like, hey, I'm really into the business you're in. Like, I'm really into cars. Right. Like, I I love doing this. And this is kind of where I want to work. Like, even Porsche, the Porsche will give you so (laughs) so much credibility off the rip. Yeah, maybe they'll give me GC3 allocation one day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's uh, that's, that's the goal, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, cool. This is why I said, uh, let's... Weapon? So we can, we can wrap it up with this. Uh, how's it going with AMG? I don't, think, I don't think you've talked about it a ton. I haven't. So uh, I don't think I've talked about it much on this podcast at all. But I did just buy... A uh, new slash used uh, C63 S AMG. Um, just put around 6,000 miles on it. I'm doing, I have my first day tomorrow to see how much uh, Mercedes is going to take for my, for my bank account. Uh, so I'm excited for that. I'm not excited for the brakes going out for the first time because that's a thousand off rip. Um, but I like it. I love it. I, I, I love the car. Honestly, every single day, it kind of just, surprises me the car drives so well it's so flat like it is it, it, i've heard this so many times but it really is like the perfect amg like I, i'm i'm so curious to because i i rented the amg gtr right like two years ago which that car insane for sure i think i feel the precision a decent amount more to justify the price of that car yeah. but i think for the average person it's not a huge difference Right. Aside yeah. from maybe the exterior, you know, exterior obviously on that car looks better. But driving experience wise, I, I don't think most people uh, will get a kick out of driving the significantly more expensive one. I obviously will because, yeah, that that was so fun. I took that car through the curves. I threw I threw it through some uh, through some mountains, uh, and it was super fun. And then I already took this car to uh, Angeles Crest out in LA, and it's so flat. It responds so well to everything. Um, the only thing I don't like about the car, uh, and it's, I guess it's kind of something minor, is coming from the CLA 45 infotainment system uh, mm. <laughs> to this one, night and day difference. This yeah. one is so slow. Like, it's, yeah. it's not even funny. It's so slow. Um, you, but other than it, that, everything yeah, else. It has Apple, Apple CarPlay, right? Like, if you connect the cable. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, you can get away with that. I don't think I use Apple CarPlay that much, though. No. Are you done? Having the cable out, I like closing the thing, the AMG thing, all the yeah. carbon fiber. Yeah. I like having that. I like having all the carbon visible. And with the Apple CarPlay, you got to have that, that cable connected right there. Yeah. No. <clears throat> yeah. So, but uh, oh, I am. Is that really the only thing you don't like? Uh, yeah. Dude, the, the V8's insane. The driving experience is insane. The appearance is insane. There's nothing on the car that looks outdated to me. The headlights are super dark. I think maybe another like small little, I guess, uh, con would be those headlights have been those headlights for a decade now. Mm, yeah. um, I think I, I, I like the CLA 45 because I mean that curve up top and curve on the bottom for the, for the daylight running lights. Uh, that was mm-hmm. that kind of yells new, or at least for anyone that knows AMG or Mercedes in general, um, that yelled new. Um, yeah. But no, did, did you have anything that you didn't like when you drove it? Um, I don't. I'm, I'm not personally a fan of all the carbon. Um, oh. Especially not on the steering wheel. I like this. I, I can do the center, the center dash, the center console. Uh, carbon. I think that looks nice. The, the steering wheel. That's way too much for me. I, I don't like all the carbon on that. I, other than that, you know what's funny? And it ruined it for me. Getting the front lip on the CLA changed those front ends for me. Because now every time I see a front end, it looks like it looks bare. Um, like I yeah. feel like it needs that extra, you know, inch and a half, two inch to really kind of square it off and fill up the all the space it's supposed to. Um, so definitely, uh, maybe five things I want to buy for the car. Um, lowering springs, just slightly lower it. Wheels, carbon lip carbon side skirts and a carbon rear diffuser. Other than that, I, oh, well, and those are five exterior things. Uh, downpipes and an E32 would probably be the only things I do engine wise. And then the car would be perfect. Pushing around 600 to the wheel. There's pretty much nothing out there that can gap that. Like, you know, like 99% of cars are not gonna win that. Um, and then the car's gonna look simple and clean. Uh, they call it OEM plus. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. The older, the older you get, the more you're into cars. Like, you go from like wanting to change everything to just I just want it to look slightly different than it comes out of the you know out of the box. Um, <coughs> though, I feel like the more expensive car you get, they kind of come out of the box already good. For example, your Porsche. I genuinely do not know what I would change on that car. Yeah. Like, an ex- uh, I would probably say an exhaust. I think that that probably be yeah. the only thing. Maybe wheels, if you want to change it up a bit. Here's one thing that I've contemplated on this car, but I don't know why. It doesn't matter how much money I make. I can't justify it. it or at least paying full part, price is wrapping a car. I would love to wrap this car matte black, put it on some uh, on some silver wheels with all the carbon accents, but I don't know if I could justify paying three to four grand for something I'm going to take off in, in, in a year. Yeah. I mean, I, I see the value. I think the, the value of paying three to four grand for the entire color change makes sense. Like, my God, man, that's pretty cheap, you know, when you compare it to a paint job. But I think that, that you're right. Yeah. In the sense of like, hey, this is going to be something I eventually take off. Um, and like, you, you don't get any money back on that. Right. At least all the parts, all the parts and stuff like that, you can sell stuff out, you know, part it out and get some money yeah. back. You get seven back. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, I think for uh, me personally, the more that wraps have been out, I'm not a fan anymore. Um, I like me just some good quality, old freshened up paint. I'm a fan as long as you don't do the extra stuff. 
You know, I feel like there's so many colors that are just so wild nowadays. Yeah. <clears throat> I think if you just keep it simple, I think with this car, I would I would go like just a matte black. Like uh, the guy who had the CLA 45 that we would watch his YouTube channel when you originally got it, uh, yeah. he wrapped his matte black. Mm -hmm. So clean, so simple. Like it's just, yeah, I, I would love it in that color. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, but we will wrap this up. We just kind of just hit a, an hour and five minutes. Uh, I like this one. Uh, I think um, most times me and you, you and I have uh, conversations that obviously are not recorded, but uh, they kind of just go with the flow and, you know, conversations and topics just come up. Uh, so I think uh, yeah. having a couple of these, uh, let's just say once a week, you know, where we kind of just do something where it's just kind of a free for all uh, would be cool. But if you guys have stuck around for all the way to the end of the video, uh, hopefully you guys uh, like the video, drop a comment, uh, anything, questions, comments, concerns. Uh, we will put all of our social media in the description. I don't, I don't know if we've done that thus far, uh, but we are actively posting on basically every platform uh, if you guys want to follow us there. Um, but yeah, cool. Catch you guys on the next one. Great.